So without further ado, I'll begin. Dr. King's legacy is a cornerstone of American history, a cornerstone of any discussion of American civil rights and the social and any social movements that you've heard of or been a part of, period. Today, we find ourselves facing a backlash to many of the reforms that Dr. King championed, a backlash too close in time to his legacy. Since the civil rights movement in the 1960s, we've seen Congress fail to pass recent voting rights legislation. During a global pandemic, we've seen political leaders fail to take care of the poorest and the neediest among us. Recent social safety nets in the form of unemployment benefits and child tax credits are being tapered off. We still see a glaring disparity in housing and mortgage lending, not to mention other issues like police and prison reform. More than that, there's been a pushback against knowing Dr. King existed and the work that he did. Book ban legislation has been reported in Texas, in Virginia, Utah, Minnesota, Pennsylvania, among other states. This does not include local school districts legislating across the nation. I'd like to share a brief video. It's about two minutes and there's a recent report on book bans and I think it's a great introduction to some of our speakers today and the topic of um, banning knowledge is a school librarian in Texas. Why are you afraid to show your face when you talk about your job and the challenges that you're facing these days? Because there was a day not too long ago when I had to stop and think when they come in with handcuffs and they come in with their warrant for my arrest for alleging that I've provided obscene material to minors who am I going to call first? Across Texas, protesters at school board meetings are accusing educators of forcing pornography or obscene content on children. This is not a political thing. This is not a witch hunt. This is genuine the concern for children. It's abuse. It is grooming behavior. It's predatory. The anger is largely aimed at school libraries and many Texas politicians are on board. In October, Republican state legislator Matt Krause requested every school district in the state scour their libraries for a list of 850 books. The infamous Texas list, the pattern seems to be um, books that are representative of LGBTQIA uh, subjects and characters and topics, um, books that may contain depictions or narratives of sexual violence, um, survivor stories. Um, some books that are about racism. The list includes New Kid, a graphic novel about a black student's struggles fitting in at a majority white school. The letter Q, queer writer's notes to their younger selves. And The Cider House Rules, a coming of age story that features a character who performs abortions. Republican Governor Greg Abbott took things a step further, ordering officials to investigate any criminal activity in public schools after complaints about two LGBTQ-themed books, he said were pornographic. I have never experienced anything like that before where um, a government agency or uh, any kind of government entity was interested in specifically what kinds of books were in the library. The Texas That uh, news clip continues for another four minutes, but I, I felt like the first two minutes was sufficient to give a sense of um, the legislation that we'll be talking about. That happens to be in Texas, but there's uh, legislation um, even regionally um, around the Chicagoland area that um, we should uh, know of and, and be um, knowledgeable about in our, in our own local communities. Um, I'll turn it over to Ben to start our introduction of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Luma, um, and thanks to 
all of our attendees for joining uh, and for our panelists as well, uh, who we'll get right into here uh, this morning. Um, so our first panelist is Deborah Caldwell Stone. And Deborah is the director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom and has served in that role since 2019. And as part of her role, she also serves as the executive director of the Freedom to Read Foundation, a 501c3 organization which participates in freedom of speech and freedom of the press litigation. And prior to that, she served as the interim and deputy director of the Office for Intellectual Freedom for nearly 20 years. And before joining the ALA, she was an appellate litigator with the law firm of Cassidy, Shade, and Glore, and a litigation attorney in the Ameritech legal department. And Deborah also earned her JD uh, right here in Chicago at Chicago Kent College of Law. So thank you, Deborah. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ben, and thank you for inviting me here today. As that news clip so richly illustrates, uh, school librarians and public librarians across the country are dealing with an unprecedented number of challenges to books in library collections. And most, if not all of these demands to censor materials directly target diverse books dealing with race or gender or sexual identity. Since 1990, our office has been tracking book challenges, collecting reports from librarians, educators, and, uh, and from uh, media reports like the one you just saw. We use this data to identify trends in censorship and note which books are most frequently challenged by those who want them out of classrooms and library collections. And each April, we share a list of the 10 most challenged books and provide the public with a snapshot of book censorship in the United States. In 2020, we saw a disturbing trend, a growing number of demands to remove books dealing with racism, the history of racism, and the lived experience of Black persons in the United States. Not coincidentally, these censorship reports began to come to our attention not long after former President Trump signed his executive order in September 2020, banning any discussion or consideration of diversity, racism, or sexism by federal employees and contractors. Prior to October 2020, nearly all or most of challenge books were books dealing with the concerns of LGBTQIA persons because there's been an ongoing narrative of framing of uh, LGBTQ materials for young people in particular as inherently improper or inappropriate for minors. Uh, but in the latter part of 2020, challenges to books by Black authors about racism and Black Americans' experiences came in in such numbers that books by Dr. Ibram Kennedy, Jason Reynolds, Angie Thomas, and Toni Morrison all found slots on our top 10 most challenged book list for 2020. Uh, the growing number of challenges we're seeing is really no accident. Um, I think uh, inspired in part by our former president's animus against divisive concepts and an ongoing challenge to materials dealing with diversity. There's been an ongoing campaign to censor any consideration or discussion of racism, slavery, Black American history, and related issues and concerns in our schools, colleges, and even universities, based on the false claim that learning about or discussing such topics advances critical race theory, um, and which are here and which uh, is defined as being inherently divisive, anti-white and anti-American. This has led groups like Moms for Liberty, No Left Turn in Education, Parents Defending Education, Family Policy Alliance, and Heritage Action to show up at school board meetings and library board meetings to demand the removal of books and resources addressing racism or books uh, addressing the concerns and experiences of LGBTQIA persons. Um, they, their claim is that most or all materials that discuss or reference gender identity or sexual identity are a category of pornography that's illegal to share with young people. And this represents really a two-pronged effort to erase the voices of marginalized communities from school and public library collections. Now, these groups, with the support of social media, have spurred a real epidemic of censorship in school and libraries. This fall, in the three-month period between September 1st and December 1st, my office received 330 unique reports of censorship detailing book challenges and other attempts to remove library resources in schools and libraries across the United States. 
These 330 challenge reports don't include challenges reported before to us before September 1st or after December 1st. And two quick comparisons will illustrate the magnitude of that number for our office. In 2020, a year marked by school and library closures uh, due to the pandemic, we only received 156 unique reports of challenges for the entire year. In 2019, we received 377 unique reports for the entire year. And we fear that we may see a doubling of 2019's numbers by the time we tally up the total of challenges reported to us in 2021. Now, this campaign against the straw man of what's called critical race theory, and I do use that term in quotes, has sometimes led to some ludicrous book challenges for example, the Tennessee Moms for, uh, for Liberty chapter filed a complaint with that state's Board of Education demanding the removal of two picture book biographies uh, representing the lives of civil rights heroes, Ruby Bridges and Rosie, Rosa Parks on the grounds that the books somehow promoted critical race theory to first and second graders. And the Katy, Texas school district put a pause on a scheduled appearance by children's author, Jerry Kraft and that was referenced in the news clip that you just saw, uh, because just one parent falsely claimed on social media that Kraft's middle school novel, New Kid, um, uh, which is really just a story about a kid learning to make new friends in a new school, uh, was intended to teach students critical race theory. And now we're seeing elected officials join the censorship bandwagon. Um, in addition to Governor Abbott of Texas, governors in South Carolina, Iowa, um, North South Dakota, um, Oklahoma, have all um, promised to pass legislation that would ban teachers and, and librarians from presenting information about racism and sexism in schools and universities. Some bills have even gone so far as to propose bans of particular books, like the 1619 Project, or Dr. Kendi's How to Be an Anti-Racist. To date, 11 states have passed laws or adopted regulations banning the teaching or consideration of race, racism, gender, sexism, um, or controversial topics in American history. And 17 states currently have comparable legislation pending in their state legislatures. Currently, we're seeing at least five states introducing bills that would strip librarians and educators of their protection from prosecution under obscenity standards, statutes, excuse me, uh, to make it easier for parents to sue librarians and educators for providing materials they don't approve of to their minor uh, children, or to allow local prosecutors to arrest librarians and educators for providing access to materials dealing with gender or sexual identity, or simply materials providing uh, accurate sex ed information. Um, you know, and we've even seen instances where uh, extremists have actually filed complaints with local law enforcement charging librarians with crimes for providing access to materials like this book is gay by Juno Dawson to young adults of the community. Now, we know many of these bills are unconstitutional and some that are already law are being challenged in the courts. In particular, the divisive concept bills adopted in New Hampshire and Oklahoma are currently being challenged in federal courts in those states. But it almost doesn't matter how a court will interpret those laws in the future, the simple passage of those laws, the knowledge that there is an animus against that content will cause school boards uh, and educators to avoid any materials, simply not add materials that might cause controversy or cause a small and unrepresentative group of parents to express outrage at a board meeting. Um, these are acts of censorship that are difficult to remedy under any circumstances, especially in a time when it's difficult for an individual family to stand up and oppose censorship in their community. Um, this chilling effect is very real. As you saw from the CNN uh, report, uh, Senator Matt Krause's, he's a state senator, uh, his list of 849 books have act has actually caused both school libraries and public libraries in Texas to review their collections and remove books simply because they appeared on that list. Um, and as a result, we're just seeing a great number of challenges, particularly in states that are like Texas that have passed legislation opposing uh, that have banned the consideration of what they call divisive concepts. 
Um, we do work with our state chapters to oppose this legislation and to assist librarians uh, and educators opposing censorship in their communities. My office is uh, particular work is to provide information and support to individual librarians uh, that are fighting censorship, but we also work in concert with ALA state chapters to appoint uh, to oppose uh, adverse legislation and to help uh, to fight to prevent its passage. Uh, however, we, we feel that in this particular year we're facing an overwhelming challenge with the number of bills that are pending in state legislatures across the country. I think I'll finish with that there and um, uh, allow others to pick up the conversation and I'll be looking forward to answering any questions that individuals might have. Well, thank you for sharing uh, all of that information, Deborah. We, we really appreciate it. And I, um, I wanted to move on to our uh, next panelist, who is Gina Keneva. Um, and Gina is a librarian at East Layden High School of Franklin Park, Illinois. Um, and has served in that role since 2019. And Gina is a graduate of UIC where she studied secondary English education as well as English writing. And then she went on to earn her master's degree from UIC as well uh, in education before beginning her 15 year career as an English teacher in Chicago. Um, so she's, she taught at schools including Corliss High School, Team Inglewood and Lindblom Math and Science Academy. And while teaching at Lindblom, she went to library school at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she earned her library media specialist certificate. And she then served as a dual teacher librarian at Lindblom before transitioning to her current role as the librarian at East Layden High School. Now, Gina is also a frequent writer of op-eds on education-related topics in local publications, including the Chicago Tribune and Chicago Sun-Times. So thank you, Gina. I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Ben, for having me. Um, and thank you, Deborah, for defending us. <laughs> um, it's been uh, quite a journey, just um, my career and just the kind of challenges you get, even just as an English teacher of what curriculum to teach. Um, and, and if you can get books, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, but I think I'll just talk a little bit about my experience in CPS um, and then my experience out here in the suburbs, which have posed kind of different issues. but. Um, at this time, um, I think librarians, um, especially school librarians, both locally and nationally, were like a very easy target. Um, our numbers as a profession are dwindling. So just to give you kind of um, just a picture of what's happening in CPS. Uh, when I first started, uh, when I was first a librarian in like 2012, um, there were close to over 400 school librarians for a 600 school district. Um, you still would like one to one, but in, in that big of a district, I would say optimistically, that's not bad. Um, after the school district went to student-based budgeting, that's a form of budgeting where um, each school gets to make its own decisions about budgeting. Um, the library, uh, the librarians now in CPS are just around 100. So that means 100 uh, schools uh, have school librarians and about 500 plus do not. So the numbers are dwindling and that's kind of a national trend as well. It's not just happening in Chicago. Um, it, you can kind of look up data on that and it, it, it's, it's a trend that's happening all over. Um, and so that means that we're a very easy target because um, a lot of times you might have a big school building, it's one school librarian kind of making these decisions where we have a lot of school librarians who um, go from school to school. So we're extremely busy. Um, we don't have a lot of time to process decision making. And so um, sometimes if there's pressure on a school librarian to, like you saw in the video, to buy or not buy a book, um, the quick decision could be made not to buy a book. Um, unless you're in a district sort of like CPS um, where you have a lot of uh, support. Um, but I, for instance, just being a school librarian for the last um, eight years, like I didn't even know someone like uh, Deborah Caldwell Stone existed. Like I didn't know that there was somebody uh, able to defend me out there besides someone at my district level um, until we met over uh, Zoom for this meeting. Um, so for instance, sometimes um, the bans 
for instance, come from the top. They may come from like oddly from superintendents. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And now they are, um, as Deborah was saying, coming from like parent groups and that happened to a colleague of mine in Donners Grove North. Um, and so the first one I wanted to talk about was with this book. And I'm just showing you the book because like I know as a, you know, as a student, you might not get a lot of time to read books uh, like for pleasure or books that are not like, you know, for uh, law school. Um, but like, yeah, I'm showing you these because you could read this in a weekend and be really informed about like what, what's going on. The, a lot of them are young adult books. They're, they're you know, they're not these, these uh, books that are hard to read or like will take you um, months or something. Um, but this is a book that was banned in Chicago Public School um, by the superintendent. So the CEO of Chicago Public School, I guess, walked into a library or something and turned a page. This is a graphic novel and saw a page of violence in this book called Persepolis. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And then decided um, that it should be banned in, in school libraries, particularly for seventh and eighth graders. So I taught in Lim Bloom, which was seventh through 12th. And so I definitely, because CPS, you have this full, uh, you know, teachers union support, which you guys have been probably seeing in the news very recently, the Chicago Teachers Union. It was very easy for me to keep it on my shelf. I, it, within like days, there was a protest on Twitter. There was like a student protest to, you know, uh, keep this on. All these kids were reading it. It was when Twitter was still cool, you guys. Um, when, you know, kids would be reading this book and they would put it um, all over. And so very easily then like, like literally a week later, the CEO apologized and then um, had her own issues with the law. I will say that um, shortly. Um, and then, but then you get like the parent groups like Deborah is saying that um, now the, what they're doing is kind of going into school board meetings. Um, like this happened, I think uh, this book allegedly is a great book. Um, they're going in and they're taking excerpts of whatever it is. So out of context and reading short excerpts of these books and then saying um, this should not be allowed in my school. So um, what we kind of see on our end, like uh, this is what I wrote about in the article Ben is kind of referring to this, how Ben contacted me is that I wrote an article in the Sun-Times about um, book banning. And it was because um, a list was circulating in Illinois to many school librarians. It did not come to me, so like knock on wood. And um, it was a list of all of these books um, by Dr. Kende, and um, you know, this is like how to be an anti-racist. All the books from the 1619, all, all, all the authors that wrote the essays for the 1619 Project to um, get them off of our shelves, basically Jason Reynolds. The, the Actually, I'm kind of saying this, sorry, prematurely. The, the list was not to get them off the shelves, but to let um, this group, it was a FOIA, to let this group know what books we had in our collection in Illinois. Um, many people responded that our collection was online. Um, some people went and found all the essays and all the collections and reported that to their principals, but many people said that their principals stood by them and their school board stood by them in saying, you can just access our, most catalogs are online, you can access and find that information um, themselves. So we're kind of getting pressure from both sides. Sometimes we might see it from uh, you know, a powerful entity like a CEO or superintendent, but um, now we're seeing parent groups um, like my um, uh, my colleague over at Donner School of North. Um, they saw colleagues. I think they have three librarians there. Um, they are lucky. Um, they they get to kind of like have more uh, conversations about it. But the, the you know they went to the school board, and some of them were not even parents at the school. And they brought in pictures of a graphic novel that was uh, called Gender Queer. Um, it was LGBTQ plus. And they brought in the most, uh, again, out of context, uh, the most kind of graphic information and put that on huge like boards and walked into the school um, like that. So I think sometimes also what we're seeing just book wise makes us an easy target because you are seeing more covers. Um, it, this is like a strange thing to say, but you are seeing more covers as you should, uh, that we're kind of celebrating people of color on covers. They're, I feel like they're targeting just even the book cover, having people of color on covers and they're targeting, especially these graphic novels. It's very easy to be like, to pull out the one scene in here that has graphic violence and being like, this should be banned. Um, so some of these things, because you, you don't even have to read it. So you, you just kind of can uh, 
I can do it that way. Um, just a, one more thing I, I wanted to talk about. Um, there is this, you know, kind of how to like educate yourself more on this. Um, there is this push um, by ALA uh, Band Books Week is in September, and that's kind of how I educate students about um, the banning of books, and they're pretty um, surprised. They, we put like, you know, it's kind of standard in libraries, but like, cause you know, like we're nerdy, we put like caution tapes on books and things like that. And kids are like, what does this mean? And I say, well, these are books that are banned and they literally think they can't read them. I'm like, no, no, you can, you can read them. So I just, I just think there's a lot uh, it's going, you know, going into this that sometimes we have to make these decisions uh, about buying books. And sometimes, especially we may not purchase a book because we hear it's on the ban list. Um, that's not me, but I, I think that does happen quite often. Well, thank you, Gina. And, and thank you for, uh, for sharing a bit about uh, what goes into, to, or what book banning looks like uh, from your, uh, your side of the equation. Um, so I, I wanted to, to move along to our, our next speaker, uh, who is Rebecca Ginsburg. And Rebecca is the director of the Education Justice Project, which is a comprehensive college and prison program that provides academic programs to incarcerated individuals and outreach services to the families of incarcerated people and returning citizens where she served in that role since 2006. And she's also a professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she teaches courses on social justice, uh, prison history, and carceral landscapes. And she earned her JD from the University of Michigan Law School, as well as her PhD in architectural history from the University of California at Berkeley. So thank you, Rebecca, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Ben. And um, I'm finding this discussion so infuriating. I really wanna just jump in and respond to what everybody else has said but I'm also really honored to be here and to share our own um, contribution. Um, I, I have some documents to share. I, I'm having some sound troubles. You can see me both in my phone and on the, um, in my computer. So if it's possible for me to put documents in the chat, I would appreciate that. And if not, I will figure out something else. Um, and I also wanted to ask Ben if he could please put up the first slide that I um, forwarded him. I, I have to uh, adjust my Zoom settings that's showing me, so I'm doing that now and then I will pull it up. Okay, no problem. Um, thank you very much. I wasn't anticipating having sound problems, so I appreciate everybody um, help. Um, and you can so, feel free to put documents in the chat as well. That's available. Oh, Okie dokie. Um, so I direct a program called the Education Justice Project, a college and prison program based at Danville Correctional Center, a men's medium security state prison in Danville, Illinois. And I was hoping and hopefully by the end of my five or ten minutes I can share some couple of photographs with you of the library that we have set up at the prison. I like to show photos of it because a lot of people have never been to a prison and even those who have been to a prison may have trouble imagining what a library in a prison looks like um, and I wanted to provide you some help in, in imagining what it is because I'm going to tell you a story about the library that we have the University of Illinois has at Danville Correctional Center and what happened to it in the context of censorship. So we have had this program at the prison since 2008 and the library consists of two rooms at the prison that um, were handed over for our use. There are about over 4,000 volumes in that library. It's distinct from the state library at the prison. As you might know, all libraries by law are required to have law books, legal texts, so that students, so that incarcerated people can prepare um, legal documents. And this, our library is separate from that state legal library. It's a library of the books that we have purchased or had donated to us for the purpose of the students, incarcerated students in our program that are taking University of Illinois courses. So it's an academic library, it's got fiction, it's got nonfiction. Um, and in January of 2019, um, we were surprised to hear that there was the same kind of um, yellow tape that Gina just described around the door of our two libraries. We, I learned about this via phone and that correctional officers were in our library going through the shelves. Um, and the yellow tape was meant to keep out everybody else, including us of, of our own library. Um, 
but we learned a few days later what had been happening. Um, the correctional officers removed over 200 volumes from the shelves of our library. Um, and because our books are organized along the Dewey classification system, it's pretty easy to see at a glance where the books had been removed and what the topic of the books were. Um, and they all were removed from history and social sciences. And in particular, the same theme that um, Deborah and Gina have already shared, there were books related to racial struggle, racial history, um, civil rights, slavery, um, anything having to do with um, race, um, some books on LGBTQ issues as well, and a few books on prison reentry. I'm not sure why those were removed. In fact, I, we don't know why any of them were removed. And um, there are gonna be two themes that I wanna um, sort of highlight in this story about what happened. Um, and one of them has to do with the um, trouble that incarcerated people face generally and having access to reading materials, which may include books from libraries or course materials, but also include um, letters from home, magazine subscriptions. The access that people behind bars have to knowledge and information and the written word is very circumscribed and very vulnerable right now. Um, so what did we do? We um, tried to figure out what was happening and tried to work out what solution was being sought by the prison authorities. And um, the communication was very, very um, tenuous, which is to say non-existent. Um, and we weren't getting answers and we weren't being told um, what the problem was or what the solutions were. Um, this actually wasn't the first time that books had been um, excluded from our program. Just a, the previous month, um, we had requested books to be taken into the prison for upcoming spring courses. And the prison had um, turned down more than ever before, including Uncle Tom's Cabin, and incidents in the life of a slave girl. And one of the books, one of the things I want to put on the in the chat, and that I hope can be shared with you, um, is the um, list of the books that were were denied and turned down, turned away by the prison authorities. So we had some experience with this, but we had never had over two hundred books. We had never had many books taken from the library, let alone two hundred at a, at a time. Um, I mean, we weren't getting anywhere. We reached out to the media. And we reached out to our state representative. Um, the media was happy to take the story and our state rep, Carol Ammons, um, was delighted to fight on our behalf. Um, things started moving once public attention was um, became focused on it. And I'm very happy that say the American Library Association and Deborah Caldwell's group were very, very helpful and, and supportive. Um, as were many other organizations that came out and spoke on behalf of the right of incarcerated people to have access to materials, especially materials that reflects because of the disproportionality in racial incarceration, um, of incarceration on racial lines in, in our state and in our country. Um, the, the importance and the value of incarcerated people having materials that reflects their experiences and their history. Um, a legislative hearing was called by Carol Ammons for July of 2019, so seven months after the incident, um, in which the Department of Corrections was called to the um, called to the floor and asked to explain what had happened and why the books had been removed. The tone was very encouraging from my perspective, and that the legislators seemed um, angry to hear about the um, the particular way in which this. Um, the censorship had happened and the lack of explanation um, and the fact that it was so clearly racially um, inflected. Um, we never received any explanation for why the books had been taken. In fact, we never received a list of the books that had been taken. Um, and that's one of the points I want to make again about censorship within the prison context. Not only do people who are incarcerated have um, very, very limited access to materials and a very vulnerable right to have access to materials. But even to push back against censorship in the prison context is, is it's challenging because of the restrictions on information sharing. Um, and we finally did get a list of the books, but we had to push and push and push for it. And then when we got it, it wasn't actually accurate in the end. Um, so it's hard to fight censorship when you can't even speak openly or have the information to know what exactly is being censored. Um, at the end of the hearing, the head of the Illinois Department of Corrections 
ordered the facility to um, return all of the books that had been taken back to the shelves of our community library. We were delighted. The students that we worked with were relieved. The rest of the people in the facility, because the books that are in our community library are not just for the use of our students. They get spread and shared and disseminated throughout the facility of 1,800 individuals. So it felt like a success for everybody involved. Um, but one of the themes I think of this morning is how, um, let me see, how, 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 um, how complicated um, and how multifaceted attacks on rights to read and access to books can be. Oh, I wanted to um, just share the testimony that we, and that um, one of our formerly incarcerated students as well provided during the, um, the hearing, it's not going in, that's okay. Um, so it sounds like a success story, but again, success is kind of a relative term, I suppose, because the attacks on um, reading and on rights to access materials are so multi-headed. Um, so 15 months after we um, were told that all of the books would be returned to the shelf for an access for the students, access um, would be provided back to the students again. Um, I was told in the middle of the pandemic to come to the prison to um, because they were consolidating the two rooms in which our library was held into a single room. Um, so we would be compelled to put the um, 4,000 texts which had previously occupied shelves in two rooms into a single room. And that's the final point I want to make, um, that censorship um, can take many, many different forms. And one way, form censorship, one way that censorship looks is excluding particular titles and taking books off shelf. Another way that censorship looks, and the way we're facing it right now, is being told that um, bookshelves and books that formerly um, took the space of two rooms, because that was what was required, need to be fit into a single space. And the only solution that we have been able to find is to literally put the bookshelves back to back. Um, or back to front, such that a third of the collection is no longer accessible, if that makes sense. Um, so that, it's a different way in which censorship operates, but it's censorship nonetheless. And I think it really behooves us to be looking out for and cautious about and wary of the, um, the creative means and measures that people are able to take to restrict people's access to books, especially um, incarcerated folks. Thank you for that, I'll leave it there. And um, I also just wanted to, as, as I'm passing it back to Ben, I'm gonna put the link to the Freedom to Learn campaigns website up for people who might want more information about the issue of access to information in prisons and jails in particular. Thank you for sharing, Rebecca. And I, I apologize, I wasn't able to uh, pull up the PowerPoint with the images uh, of the prison library. Um, but I have included that PowerPoint uh, in the chat for anyone uh, that, that wants to pull that up and, and see those images. Um, and so we'll turn over to uh, our, our final speaker here. We have uh, Professor Renee Hatcher. Um, and Professor Hatcher teaches uh, right here at UIC School of Law, uh, where she's also the director of the Community Enterprise and Solidarity Economy Clinic whose mission is to represent worker-owned cooperative businesses, nonprofit or small business that operates for the benefit of an underserved community. And prior to her contributions at the law school, which began in 2018, she taught in the community development clinic at the University of Baltimore School of Law and served a postdoctoral appointment at the University of Texas Austin's Institute for Urban Policy Research and Analysis. And prior to that, she served as a staff attorney and project director for the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. And it was during her time there that she also represented individuals in matters of employment discrimination and prisoners' rights in the Northern District Court of Illinois. And Professor Hatcher also earned her JD from New York University School of Law. So thank you, Professor Hatcher. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Ben. Um... So I'm so thrilled to be on this panel and I was reflecting a little bit as we honored King Day yesterday, why this 
panel was so important right now, not only because of the rise in incidents and um, as we've seen the laws that have been passed in state legislatures around the country to ban specific material related to the Black Freedom Movement or um, just our collective history, uh, the contributions of uh, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx folks to that history. And you know, sometimes they're really uh, gripping and awful truths of the things that have happened in the United States. Um, but also I think in the way that King Day is typically honored, right? Because I do think so much of what we're talking about related to book bans, it's not only banning certain material, but how that material gets told. And one of the things that I always feel like it's important for us to realize um, so often Martin Luther King, his contributions um, really are um, censored. <laughs> They're whitewashed in a way. Um, every year, I feel like when we talk about King and, and what he stood for, and we see that so, um, so I think clearly now with the way in which um, often his words, uh, quotes are taken and used um, ultimately to stand for everything sometimes that he was against um, in really trying to deal with, I think, the structural issues related to racism, militarism, uh, capitalism, right, or materialism that he talked about in his famous Vietnam speech. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the things that um, I wanted to kind of talk about was basically not only censorship, but also the way in which the larger historical narrative, the way in which the history of this country has always been one that has tried to write out the contributions uh, of uh, oppressed people, of their uh, particular perspectives related to history, and sometimes of just simply historical facts. Um, and I thought, you know, one way that we do that as lawyers, one way that we do that as legal educators is really by um, talking about the legal context, right? And thinking about it critically as we try to reconcile all of these things related to the book ban. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about anti-literacy laws as really the, the um, predecessor for book bans and, and really trying to put in context, I think what we're seeing now, which has again been, has existed in some form uh, or other in terms of censorship or trying to limit the access of certain folks to particular types of information or perspectives or history. Um, so I think I have screen sharing privileges, um, but what do I mean just briefly? I, I think I can pull this up just a second. Okay, great. Uh, so I wanted us to actually look at some of the Okay, great. So I wanted us to actually look at some of the text of some of these laws and um, just let me lay the groundwork a little bit. So anti-literacy laws, what do I mean by that? Um, they were specific laws on the books, uh, mostly during the 19th century in the United States uh, that banned black people, black enslaved people uh, from learning how to uh, read, write, uh, some of them were directed at um, Black folks in particular in terms of actually teaching themselves how to read or, or being able to read or being prevented to do certain types of um, work in relationship to uh, reading or writing. And then others basically banned um, individuals, both white and Black or uh, free and enslaved uh, from teaching uh, black folks how to read or write. And so there's a proliferation of these laws in the 19th century, but prior to that, uh, one of the things I wanna offer in thinking about the larger context was um, both prior to the American Revolution, so when you know, the United States was still a British colony or we uh, think about uh, the original colonies of the US, um, Black folks who were in this country during that time um, often were exposed to reading, um, usually through religious organizations, 
right? Or, or trying to convert uh, black folks in this country to uh, Christianity in particular. And so often they were taught how to read in trying to get them to both convert, read the Bible and things like that. Um, it wasn't until um, post-revolution 19th century that we really see a proliferation of these anti-literacy laws. And in part, you know, obviously this goes hand in hand with the antebellum period and slavery, um, but in part, right, were aimed at preventing black folks from understanding and learning the context in which they were living, right? Actually having the means to perhaps escape their conditions. So being able to write or being able to write up papers, for example, that might then allow them to you know, flee the South or, or flee um, their enslaved conditions. And um, I want us just to, to get a sense of what these laws look like. So I'm gonna show you just some text from some of the laws and then talk a little bit, I think about the through line to the anti-literacy laws um, to the book bans that we're talking about now, to you know the, the rise of I think the um, anti-crit CRT critical race theory, but also just more importantly like anti-history book bans and censorship that we see across the country. Uh, so just a flavor of what I'm talking about, right? So these are some of them that were passed in the 19th century. Uh, Alabama, for example, you know, there were anti-literacy laws in pretty much all of the slave states. They took different flavors and tones. Um, but Alabama, for example, used the language of any person who shall attempt, teach any free person of color, slave to spell, read, or write, shall upon conviction thereof be uh, by indictment be fined in a sum not less of $250, no more than $500, right? So one of the misconceptions of some of the anti-literacy laws is that, that only enslaved persons were uh, prohibited from learning how to read and write. That is not true, right? Um, it was specifically aimed at black people in this country who may have been enslaved, who may have been free. Um, but in, in this case, that was, um, Alabama is actually one of the believe it or not, most lenient punishments for actually teaching uh, Black folks how to read and write. So the next one, and all of these are, again, 1820s, 1830s, and I'll say why, you know, a little bit of the context back then. Uh, but then Virginia, for example, that all meetings, this is, comes directly from the statute that was there, um, that all meetings or assemblages of slaves or free Negroes or mulattoes mixing and associating with such slaves at any meeting house or houses in the night or at schools or schools for teaching them reading or writing either in the day or night under whatsoever pretext shall be deemed and considered to be an unlawful assembly, right? So this is talking again, like in getting at the larger point of just simply education, right? And, and specifically uh, black folks learning how to, uh, uh, learning in, in larger groups, right? And so some of this um, is really related to the types of gatherings that would happen, sometimes um, organized by uh, black persons um, black, in, in black communities, sometimes on plantations, um, certainly sometimes, um, and maroon communities, right? And, and teaching folks how to read and write. Uh, and then we'll look at the last one. So Georgia, that if any slave, Negro or free person of color or any white person shall teach, oh, sorry, a second. Uh, shall teach any other slave, Negro or free person to read or write either written or printed characters, the said free person of color or slave shall be punished by fine and whipping or fine or whipping at the discretion of the court. And if a white person is so offending, he or she or they shall be punished with fine not exceeding $500 and imprisonment in the common jail at the discretion of the court beyond um, who said offender is tried, right? And so I think the Georgia statute in particular starts to look at the actual different types of punishment depending on who was facilitating right, the learning, right, who was teaching 
um, the black folks basically how to read and write. And this is carried on. There's one more I want to look at, which is North Carolina. And then I'll just say more about what I think this has to do with book bans today. Uh, so this is the text from the North Carolina anti-literacy law. And uh, you see the preamble there, but so being enacted by the General Assembly of the Nor uh, state of North Carolina, that any free person who shall hereafter teach or attempt to teach any slave within the state to read or write, the use of figures accepted or shall give them to such, to, or sell to such slave or slaves, any books or pamphlets, right? So you see there, like they're actually prohibited from having books or from um, having any types of written materials or uh, individuals are prohibiting from giving them materials. So it's not only that you cannot teach them how to read or write, you cannot give them materials that would perhaps allow them to teach themselves. Um, shall be liable to indictment in any court of record in the state having jurisdiction and upon conviction shall at the discretion of the court, if a white man or woman be fined not less than $100, no more than $200 or imprisoned. So by punishment of imprisonment, and if a free person of color shall be fined, imprisoned, or whipped at the discretion of the court, not exceeding 39 lashes, nor less than 20 lashes, right? So again, you see there the difference in punishment of actually teaching um, Black folks how to read. And in North Carolina, it was, it was Black enslaved folks in particular. And so I wanted just to point this out because, you know, again, so much of this, the reason behind why we're talking about all of this, the reason behind um, and the, the thing that is common to book bans, that is common to the censorship of uh, book bans, censorship of materials in prisons today, uh, in public schools today, right, is, is one, I think, actually facing up to the history of this country, um, but then two, right, you know, the concern was that, well, if, if we have access to these types of materials, if we actually are confronted with um, the history of the United States, it will compel people to act, right? And compel people to act towards a better and more just society. Uh, it will force us to actually have to consider the role that race has played in this country, the role that racism has played in this country, the role of slavery in this country, and how it has formed us and continues to um, continues to affect, I think, our institutions and our society today. And um, the other thing that I want us to think about was that also like that that it was a way in which to prevent um, black folks in particular during slavery right, to understanding um, not only the conditions that they were experiencing, but also, right, giving them the tools that they needed to fight for their freedom. Uh, in every social movement, in every, certainly, in, at every stage of the Black freedom movement in the United States and in, in the, the world more broadly, right, having written materials, Right, having power of the press or publication has been key to disseminating information, for example, right, has been key, for example, to um, uh, getting folks, um, for example, on board or, or organizing or understanding whatever moment in the abolitionist movement. Um, for example, the publication, which was one of the first abolitionist publications, the North Star. Uh, used to talk explicitly about the conditions of slavery. It allowed folks who had experienced slave, say, slavery to tell their stories. It facilitated a lot of the organizing that actually led to abolition and the passage of the 13th Amendment. Um, so, you know, Frederick Douglass's um, uh, work on the North Star, his contributions, and uh, a lot of the stories were um, really instrumental in not only um, activating and, and disseminating really the experiences of slavery, um, not only to enslaved persons, but also or folks who had um, escaped their um, enslavement, but also uh, to, um, to white folks in the country who really didn't have a sense of what that experience was. So folks in the North 
or uh, what that was, was, but that only could happen through the ability to read and write and have access to the narratives, history, and perspectives of individuals who were experiencing, right, the oppressive and, and really devastating conditions of slavery. Um, and, you know, I would pose that a lot of, a lot of this carries through today. It's like, it's basically, and it's also, I don't want us to think that this is a new thing that has happened or is a recent thing. Um, you know, I can, I know of a, a personal book ban going back to 2013, long before the rise of Trump in the state of Indiana, in which um, gov the former governor, Mitch Daniels, was trying to uh, ban Howard Zinn's book, The People's uh, History of the United States, which kind of brings up and, um, indigenous genocide in the United States. Um, but I know I'm over time and hopefully um, that at least helped to ground us a little bit in the historical context. And I'll stop there in case there's more that we should probably do before we wrap up. Thank you, uh, Professor Hatcher. And, and thank you to uh, the rest of our speakers as well. I, I think you all did a great job of covering this issue from a variety of uh, different angles. And I'm, uh, I know we, we only have a, a couple minutes left here uh, this uh, afternoon, but did wanna uh, open up uh, the floor to questions um, either via chat or uh, for folks to chime in. Um, and I can start with the first one. Um, and this could be uh, uh, in relation to the organizations or uh, schools that uh, each panelist uh, works with. But my question is uh, for, for those students that uh, are interested in this issue and want to get involved uh, in some way, um, what are some suggestions that any of you uh, have for them? I think just even taking a look at the ALA's website on it um, kind of gives you a ton of links. Like it was really helpful to me when I first started becoming a librarian. Um, and then, you know, just kind of seeing uh, the, the types of books that are banned are, are ones you've probably even read. Um, and the ones that you're seeing now, um, I, I think are really worth you're reading like just like I said like some of them you can you can read rather quickly um uh and it, I think it's it's worth knowing uh what, what's out there for young adults right now because it's, it's those books that are really I mean things like Mockingbird are always being challenged like they've been challenged like to kill a Mockingbird I'm sorry can been challenged for you know last five or six decades and it's still one of the top 10 but these young adult ones um People are very, I guess, scared of what um, are going in the mind of young adults uh, across the nation. I mean, because it's uh, most of the bans are happening that are uh, in the media anyways, are at the high school, middle school level. Um, so people really want to control what goes into uh, what, what they have access to and what they can read. So I really, I really do think you're, you're going to enjoy it too. They're all good reads. But um, I think just taking a look at some of the, some of the books out there. Um, and seeing, you know, uh, what, what people are trying to ban, I think are, 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 good, are good ways to start. Um, ben, if there are students at, at the law school who'd like to start getting involved, um, the Freedom to Read Foundation is a closely affiliated uh, legal advocacy group uh, at ALA. Um, we're at ftrf.org. Um, and we have a multiple venues for individuals to get involved in litigation and legislative advocacy, uh, challenging censorship. Um, uh, and we cover the waterfront, but our particular focus right now, of course, is this adverse legislation, either uh, banning divert divisive concepts or uh, attempting to criminalize the activities of school and public librarians and reaching out to young people with controversial materials. Um, and there may well be opportunities 
for uh, a legal internship um, in the next few months. We're working on that right now. So if you wish to reach out to me, my email address is dstone at ala.org. And I'll be happy to discuss volunteer opportunities with anyone who'd like to engage with that work, either through FTRF or ALA, which does have an active member group, the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable, that works together to do both advocacy and education around censorship. And if I could just chime, if I could just chime in very briefly, I put the website to the Freedom to Learn campaign in the chat. There's an awful lot in the chat of great resources. But um, if you Google Freedom to Learn, that's a campaign that's particularly targeting the needs of incarcerated people to have access to reading materials and other um, there are other aspects of the campaign as well. There are many options for people to get involved. Um, we currently have a task force on higher education in prison and um, we'll be seeking to expand the mailing list of people who can put pressure on their legislators um, in here in Illinois in response to some of the recommendations that are going to be coming out of that, that we anticipate are going to be coming out of that task force. Also, people are able to get involved as members of the campaign itself. There are many subcommittees, including outreach and communications, and there are law students that are part of those structures. So if people are interested in learning more about the opportunities of the Freedom to Learn campaign or getting on the mailing list, I encourage folks to go onto that website. Thanks so much. I, I know we're wrapping up. Um, and many have responsibilities at one, whether that's class or meetings. Um, but um, if, if anybody would like to have the opportunity to ask uh, a question, we just want to give that time. Received, <clears throat> I received a, a question via chat um, that uh, was asking, uh, any recommendations on banned books uh, that students should read? Oh yeah, stamp, uh, Stamped. Uh, so there's an adult version called Stamped from the Beginning by Dr. Kendi, Eva Max Kendi. There's a young adult version that now, Deborah, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it's by Jason Runnels and Dr. Kendi. It's like a remix version. It's also called Stamped. I didn't have it as like out in our library, but it's like the number one banned book in America, like is that one? Um, you could finish it in a weekend, and it's it's this version written for young adults. What what's awesome is like Jason Reynolds is just like he's like the god of uh, young adult literature right now, and he when he, he was interviewed about it, he said, "What I know is like kids are always like on their phones." He's like, "I am like competing with that," and so he's thinking about that as he's rewriting it. And um, so some chapters are like one page long. There's like a chapter that's like three words. So it, it really is, um, I haven't finished this one because it's like 600 pages long, but the other one is a nice 200 page and it really will teach you history that I, I didn't know a, a lot of the history in there that, um, it, so it teaches you something and, and yeah, I, I know on the presentation I gave that was like, it's the number one banned book. And um, I got that from ALA. So it might be just a young adult banned book, but that's a, that's a great one. Um, if you want to learn more about book banning in the United States, I strongly recommend a book by Professor Emily Knox, who's at UIUC's iSchool called Book Banning in 21st Century America. Um, it's really an excellent overview of book censorship trends um, and some of the reasons, both sociological and historical behind book bans in schools and libraries across the United States. Um, and if you have an opportunity to hear Professor Knox speak on book banning, it's really a, a great opportunity. So um, that, that it's a non-legal resource. Uh, there's plenty of First Amendment uh, and uh, equal protection books I'm sure you can access in your library at UI see, but um, this is a, a great overview of the phenomenon and I recommend to everyone. And I've typed the title into the chat for you. I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us um, today as we um, honored Dr. King's legacy and talked about some education awareness that allows us to be 
active in um, continuing his work and active in being knowledgeable about some of the, the uh, threats to um, understanding um, American history and his history as well. So thank you all, Rebecca Ginsburg, De uh, Deborah Caldwell Stone, Jana Kniva, Professor Hatcher. Um, this was invaluable. And as I say with these type of meetings, you know, any one of what you contributed today could be a full program. And so I look forward to continuing this conversation in some way or form um, and um, having the pleasure of speaking with um, you more um, in different capacities. So thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone for joining. Have a great day.